thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's extreme, I'm extremely delighted to see such, such a large, large community having formed here uh, so quickly. I definitely wasn't expecting this to see like over, over 30 people at the meetup and you know the fact that it seems like this group has grown by more than 100% since the last time you guys congregated is even more encouraging. Yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of, so right now we have um, Mike <coughs> myself, who I'm the original uh, inventor of Ethereum. I wrote the white paper. Here we have Gav, who is our uh, lead plus plus client developer. And, and so today I think what we'll be talking about is some uh, general updates in terms of what we've been doing to, with Ethereum, both on the technical side where there are some uh, fairly, ma fairly major changes coming to the, uh, uh, coming in on, on the low, especially on the lower level, and uh, so, and some of the uh, business aspects, some uh, some of the economic a economic aspects of the protocol, and also what well, really what what you guys can uh, can potentially end up, end up doing with it. So, uh, what, what what was the conversation that we that, that you guys had last time? Uh, when you were here, we talked. We went over some contract examples. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Right. So, in terms of uh, so I'm going to I'm going to assume that the group uh, knows the uh, contracts at least at least somewhat well. <laughs> but uh, uh, but the contract language is uh, is obviously uh, much more much more complex than that of that offered by by something like Bitcoin or 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 Litecoin or or colored coins or any of the other platforms because. Unlike those platforms where there's basically a finite number of transactions that you can deal with, in Ethereum you have this create this programming language that allows you to potentially to theoretically do it, do anything. And ultimately, you know, we we are the ones that are going to be writing all, all these contracts. You know, you guys are. And, and there's potentially an infinite number of applications that you can, that you can do with it. Like one idea that I just uh, came up with a few days a, a few days ago is uh, to if you guys have heard of the site a gambling site Just Dice. It's sort of like Satoshi Dice, except the <coughs> attraction is, is that the, it's, it's, so with Satoshi Dice, the only thing you can do with it is you can gamble with it. You send money to a Bitcoin address, and there's like a 48% chance you get twice as much back, 52% chance you get nothing. And there's a few a few other uh, addresses that have like different odds, where, where even in any case, the average fee is about 1.9%. So with Just Dice, there's actually two things you can do with it. One thing you can, one thing is that you can uh, just gamble, and the other thing is you can actually invest in the site. So when you invest in the site, you're adding yourself to the pot, and uh, when people, when other people bet, bet against the site, the pot can either can either go up or down. And as the as the pot grows, then your share of the pot grows as well. So the one thing that we realized is that potentially you can turn just the entire thing of, of just dice into a contract. You can run the entire business, the entire business as this sort of de this decentralized contract that, ha that has completely no owners, no operators. You just contractify the entire the entire function of, of gambling and, and of and of investing. So the entire thing just functions without any kind of centralized servers, with pretty much without anything whatsoever. So that that's one idea. Then another idea that we like to have just that came up with is uh, this concept of gold coin, or basically. So we already have this idea of uh, of storing a constant amount of fighting against volatility through this hedging contract mechanism, where I put in, I put a thousand dollars into the contract, or I put in a thousand dollars worth of ether into the contract. You put in a thousand dollars worth of ether. Then after 30 days, I get a thousand dollars worth of ether back. You get you get the rest. So the and the way that it figures out what a thousand dollars worth of ether is is either through one through some external price feed or through some combination of of external price feed and, and so forth. So the, or actually, there is one way that you might be able to do it com sort of completely trust free, which is if once people start doing decentralized companies on top of the platform, you can actually have these hedging contracts directly listen to, a, to, the, to the markets for, for shares in those companies. And then you can hedge, you can hedge against the, va the value of some, of some particular company. And, and in that case, you really you don't need any any kind of speed at all, which is actually a, a somewhat interesting insight. Not not crucial, but has some interesting implications. So the idea that gap that gap had is what if 
you take this, uh, this idea of a hedging contract and you somehow turn it into a currency. So you have a currency, who, so you really have two currencies. You have one currency whose value say, is, value is uh, the same as gold. And then, you have, and then you have this other currency whose value is equal to, so equal, where each share of that, of, that, of that asset is equal to something like 20 ether minus one gold. So the trick is, is that the contract has these two sets of accounts where it has, say, 10 shares of gold, and then it has these 10 shares of two ether minus one gold, and then the gold liabilities all cancel out, but there's ether liabilities, and the contract has an ether balance to pay for them. So the, tri so the idea here is that you can have this entire currency that allows you to, that allows people to basically store an asset whose price will be the same as the price of gold, or the price of dollars, or the, pri or the price of, uh, of Apple shares, or, or whatever else without actually relying on any, any kind of banking system. All you basically need is some entity to provide, to provide price feeds. So you just, you've just created zero, zero infrastructure, stable value finance for the, for the entire world. Probably one of the, one of the right. So if the idea can be, made, can be made to work, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lofty goal, but in order for, but that, but the idea, in order to actually implement the idea, you know, it has to be written as a contract. It's a very complex idea with lots of nuances. People need to write, write up the entire contract with lots of different clauses to try and figure out exactly what the best algorithm for this, for, for this, for this sort of thing is. And, you know, we, that's just something that, uh, you know, somebody, whether it's here or elsewhere, is going have to have to take up the challenge and try and implement it. Yes? Uh, if, if we have the technical infrastructure to do this, do you think you could like sketch out how the contract would work and kind of how it's different from the, the perspective of just owning the shares of like gold representative okay. currency? Right, so gold representative currency is actually fairly simple. It's just a currency and there's some entity somewhere that makes a promise to exchange it for real gold. So here, real gold doesn't exist, right? So you have two currencies once again. So let's say the price of one gold is 10 ether. Then you have two currencies. One currency is, wor is worth one gold. And the other currency is worth 20 ether minus one gold. Now suppose that, so you have this sort of bank, right? And this, so we have this contract that acts as a decentralized bank. And this decentralized bank can have assets, but the only assets the contract can have is ether. Then the contract has liabilities. So what liabilities does it have? 100 units of this, 100 units of that. So 100 units of gold, then 100 units of 20 ether, mi 20 ether, ether minus the gold. So the gold liabilities cancel out. So no matter where the gold price goes, the, the contract will just have, the contract's total liabilities will, will be a, a fixed amount of ether, and the, and the contract will have an ether balance with which to pay that. That assumes that uh, ether remains positive because uh, uh, deficit ether may not be recognized by a, a community in any sense. So right, no, there will be, there's no such thing as deficit ether here. So when we say the contract has a liability, what we mean is, so the contract already has an ether balance, right? The contract has inside of it, to say, the 2,000 ether. And then the contract also has this balance, these two balance sheets, where these two balance sheets represent the two different currencies. And those balance sheets represent promises to pay out ether. And the contract is written in code. Like, these people, you can trust that the contract will honor its obligations because it's written that way. So there's, yes? Oh, so if the price of gold went arbitrarily high, that, right. That is pretty much the, the edge case that makes the whole problem hard. So the trick is you have some kind of market-based mechanism where if one side goes too low, then you sort of, then you sort of save, then you make some kind of key mechanism where you favor that side and you disfavor the other side, and you try and like set up a market so that it's self-correct. So that's that's the hard problem. So I guess like what, what you really want uh, if you're making a financial system. Avoid counterparty risk and avoid yeah. like contagious defaults yeah. in times of price volatility. Right. And it seems like we still kind of have that problem here. Right. We basically we have this sort of black swan risk of what if gold goes down by more than fifty percent. Yes. That's the that is the issue. And you know fundamentally the thing is is that the system is not going to be able to store about a billion dollars worth of value. Like if let's say the system stores a billion dollars worth of value, then interest in the system drops by ninety nine percent. There's no way that that system is going to be able to still store a billion dollars worth of value. So I wonder if you can get around this problem by structuring it so that it's linear for small changes in price, and then as you have like sort of black swan, like extreme fat tail changes, 
the derivative approaches zero, so there is kind of like a well-bounded like asymptote on the total payout of the contract in a principal fashion, so that you can avoid counting party risk. Um, so say, say that one more time. We're, we're all exploring that. So you, you basically have this problem where we like to model the world as following like a Gaussian distribution uh, in finance, and then you have extreme fat tails in terms of price movement, and people don't model for these appropriately, and it causes like you know maybe the financial system blows up in some fashion. But maybe you could make contracts where the payout structure on the fat tails is like structured to be the inverse of the way, so that the actual like distribution of outcomes of the contract is normally distributed or is like strongly asymptotically bounded, right. so even if the prices change in an extremely chaotic right. crazy so One thing you suppose you could, right. so one thing I suppose you, you could have is you could have three different currencies where the third, where the third currency has a, a very, a very negative payout in the event of a of, of a black swan in either direction, and then a positive payout normally. So, but it, I think what he's suggesting is that you can pull that from a bunch of the two currencies. That if you can even model your contract. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. You're mapping and handle the contingency with the smooth transfer. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it is. I suppose it's doable. Yeah. The question. The question is sort of exactly how we want the risk. I guess the appeal is then you, you completely avoid the probability of default because you can have the counterparties put up like the provable like asymptotic maximum and if the price went to infinity, here's what the payout of the contract. Right. Is. Well, now the price going up to infinity isn't really the huge problem, right? Well, it's I would say it's more like the, the bigger problem is well, around, well the bigger problem is what if the price of what if the price of gold drops to zero? So I suppose that's the same thing as the price of ether. Or, what, sorry, what is the what if the price of ether goes to zero? Which right. is the same thing right. as the price of gold. Right. Hey, uh, before we get too far, let's, would it be okay if uh, we have, you went through a little bit of a schedule of some uh, various things yesterday, so uh, a technical schedule, and uh, yeah, well, I'd like to bring that on, on uh -huh. once we uh, talk about the technicals, so uh, actually how about we'll let you talk about some of our technical ideas. Um, the whole trust free closure thing. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so, um, correct me if I'm wrong again, but when, um, when Ethereum started, it was, um, we have this great invention, Bitcoin, that allows us to zap value around the world. Uh, precisely what the value is um, can often change in a volatile manner, but nonetheless, it did allow us um, then we uh, thought, ah, actually, maybe we want to do something slightly more than zapping value around the world. We want to uh, have some other functions in this, uh, in this um, state transition system that everybody can agree on. And so there were various efforts at uh, cryptocurrency V2, including a mass deployment of coins and a bunch of others. Um, and when Vitalik came across this, he had the great idea of saying, right, well, hold on, why can't we just abstract this completely and uh, allow any application um, on top of this uh, consensus uh, network? And this was the theory. Um, the, conclusion, the conclusion from this is that there were still some kind of legacy aspects to the design of Ethereum that were kind of still <coughs> kind of hanging over from bit one of these aspects is uh, within uh, in, the, in the terminology. Uh, for instance, Ether script, uh, similar to the Bitcoin script. But of course, it's not really a script. It's actually a virtual machine that has its own uh, virtual machine code. Um, another aspect of it was the notion uh, that value is built in to the protocol. So. Although we have contracts, and although contracts can perfect, perfectly adequate um, uh, vehicles for uh, uh, transmitting value, uh, we also have this notion that, that there is an inbuilt value, ether, um, and this is what we use to pay fees. Ideally, we wouldn't have to have any, any sort of value at all. Um, the reason that we have it is because uh, contracts need to be paid for. Uh, if they are not paid for, then you have the problem of the if the 
the bombs, people putting wild through in contracts and sending them off to the network to compute, of course, to compute the network computation at the end. Um, and we're coming to realize that maybe there is a, a way that we can design the system in order to remove, um, or at least contract it by, uh, this notion of the base currency, allowing miners to be paid in any currency uh, that people are willing to pay them in, miners are willing to accept. What this does is it purifies the design somehow. It allows us to say this is actually uh, a purely uh, abstract transactional uh, consensus system. One of the other dimensions to this is the notion of what a transaction is. So the notion of a transaction originally in Bitcoin would be something that was securely signed. And it said, you know, move, move value from, from this, from, from, from these uh, spent transaction outputs, effectively from these accounts to these accounts. Um, Ethereum obviously made this considerably more abstract and allowed for arbitrary uh, state transitions. Um, but the interesting thing was that the straight state transitions could themselves uh, affect other state transitions. So this is uh, when, when in the original white paper this was this was uh, stated as being transactions uh, can invoke other transactions they can create other transactions and they can of course create contracts as well. Um, these transactions in the original white paper would be stacked up to the side and then executed only once the contract itself is finished executing. But what we can do now is we can we can it's kind of like a delayed function call in a way because stack up the transactions, the transactions may well end up uh, going to contract, which is effectively uh, a lot of code that needs to be executed, and we stack them up to the side. Uh, what if, rather than stacking them up to the side, we executed them immediately? Then we have something approaching a closure framework. What if transactions, instead of being in sort of Bitcoin style, they do an execution and then bang you back, what if they had a return value? We already allow them to take data as an input. What if we can allow them to give data as an output? That's kind of the, the crown jewels to, to, to the closure system. Now all we have is a distributed consensus-based closure system. And it's not a cryptocurrency at all anymore. It's just a way for people to put uh, computer programs into the ether and have them run in a trusted manner so everybody can trust what the state of the entire system is at any time. So are you talking about returning a continuation? Because I guess it's a terminal like, like, like in the <laughs> lisp, lisp sense, T is a T language, return a continuation, is that what we're talking about? Um, yes, in effect. I mean, you can see it in both ways. So it can be a closure where the internal data of the closure changes between, uh, so you, you, you uh, call into the closure, and then after the return, it's actually a different closure that you'll call into next time because the internal state has changed. But yeah, you can also call it a continuation. That's, that's, uh, that's a nice one. And so what we have is a decentralized, trusted closure or continuation system. So, sorry, I may not be enough of a computer science guy, but I didn't quite catch how the, you lost the currency because it still costs... Uh, right. So the currency so still exists. But not as part of the core protocol but rather as a contract within it that lives on the protocol, just like any of the other contracts. So are you talking about uh, the system being allocated in terms of continuations, which is to say this is just about the granularity of scheduling and uh, what executes as a single autonomous chunk, right? Um, can I elaborate on the question? Well, okay, we have an autonomous
Um, so the infinite, infinite recursion is reined in anyway just because of the uh, fees that have to be paid when you make a call. Well, at some point, you have like 10 minutes is the period you receive your block chain. There's protocols on the one that you need to that has this idea of an approximate time for each block. Okay. Okay, I mean, that's the virtue of this whole idea. Sure. Proof of work, of course, is this period. Sure. So... Absolutely. Okay, and then if we extend beyond this, we are artificially stretching. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm, I'm asking in the lexicon of how you schedule processes, the relationship of the period that could be in the block. Okay, I understand. To these um, the fees will be such that um, that won't be an issue. We expect transactions to take no more than, say, a millisecond. Um, so the notion that it has to, uh, you have to do all transactions in a minute uh, isn't. You know, all transactions will be done in a few seconds tops. Um, if they were the less, then if, if they take more than a millisecond, they start to get really expensive. Sure. Yeah. Right. That's one of the ideas that we had is basically to make the fee super linear. So, if your transaction, if your if your transaction does ends up taking up say a hundred operations, you would pay a fee of a hundred. But then if it does a thousand operations, you pay a fee of two thousand. And then at ten thousand operations, you pay a fee of thirty thousand, and so forth. In any case, it's not a problem that is um, brought along by a new, this, this particular new design. It's something that's always been there. It's, it's the, the problem of, you know, what if there's a very, very large computation that someone puts in the network? It just means that there are lots of fees to be paid. Yeah, yeah. Um, and given that any, nobody will have that amount of fees, that, not that amount of value to pay for the fees, then it will stop. Not so, but the scheduling model becomes an integral transaction. How do you encode Well, so contracts will never take anywhere near that amount, anywhere near the amount of time to execute that if they would ever become an issue for the scheduling, uh, scheduling model. It also seems like I don't really understand where the question is coming from because all they're saying is you're reordering the computation, but the still is all happening in the and so it's the same amount of computation. So the order in which you choose to like evaluate things does not seem relevant to. No. Right. Uh, so question. How does this work as taking out Ethereum is no longer like a privileged first class? Well, so it is privileged, but it's privileged in a different way. Yeah. Right. So way. yeah. So the way that we'll prove that it's privileged is is that the official Ether currency contract will be free mined such that it has an address of one. So in order to call it, you will need to do one byte. Whereas if you make your own contract, <laughs> then it's going to be some hash and it's going to be it'll, 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 20 bytes. But so the idea is, I'm, I'm a miner. And I'm going to say, like, okay, you know, I like Ether, but I also like, I don't know, like, Joe Coin and Bob Coin or whatever. So I'm willing to mine any blocks that are going to pay me my, like, fees in Ether or Joe Coin or Bob Coin. Sure. But then some other miner may have a different, like, subset of transactions that he's interested in. Yeah. But once it gets mined, once I do the work of putting in the blockchain, now every other miner is going to verify it, regardless of whether they're interested in the currency. Right. Or the right. So that's the, the, economic, the economic challenge, basically, which is... Uh, how, how do you make how do you make sure that an individual miner has the has the incentive to include only those transactions which which provide more value to the person including them than cost to the entire network together to execute? So we have to make some simplifying assumptions. So one so the big assumption is that all miners have roughly roughly equal hardware, or rather that all rather that all nodes have roughly equal hardware, which basically translates us into saying. We, ex we, ex we basically assume that you have at least, at least a, certain, a, a certain level of hardware. And then fr from there, the argument actually is that, so suppose that, there are, suppose that first of all, a simple example, all miners are equal, there's a thousand of them. If you are, if you are a miner, then suppose you get a transaction which pays you 10 cents worth of fees. Pr likely it'll be an Ether, but perhaps somebody will want to pay, pay fees in Ether Dogecoin or whatever. So in that in that case, what will happen what will happen is that we, the question that you will ask is is the is the reward for me higher higher than the cost for me? 
So the cost for you is basically the cost of processing the transaction. The cost to the network is the cost of the cost for you of processing, processing the transaction times 10,000. The reward for you is, ten, is actually it's not 10 cents. It's 10 cents divided by 10 by 1,000 because you only have a 1 in 1,000 chance of mining the next block. So because of that, you have this this formula that you know is the is the re the revenue divided by a divided by a thousand times a thousand uh, greater greater than the cost. So the two thousand sort of cancel out, and you would actually still the miner would still have the incentive to include the transaction only if the cost the re the to the the the, to the value of the transaction is greater than the cost of the transaction to the entire network. So then you run into this problem. Well. What happens if you know we have we have some miners with we have a bunch of huge, really huge miners with 10 percent network power? Then those transactions those miners will have the incentive to include a way way huge number of transactions because they're 100 times bigger. So the way that you would solve that is basically with a sort of like a floating block limit. So you would say normally let's suppose you would take the long term average of how many operations uh, there is in, a, in there is in a given block, and then you and then say either double it. Or we could triple it, or we could multiply by 1.1, or whatever, whatever constant you know the economics ends up ends up deeming optimal. And then we say blocks cannot have that number of operations, or can, rather cannot have more than that number of operations. So basically, you take that that sort of uh, that that sort of uh, power law that that, that sort of tip, tip of the power law distribution, and you sort of just flatten that at the top. And it's and assuming that the constants are calibrated correctly, it should it should turn out to basically mitigate its effect to within some reasonable margin. Yes? Sure. Okay. So, we'll talk, right, so let's uh, get, we can, we can get back to the business side now, um, or uh, the project side in general. So, at this point, uh, the, we have this, uh, right, so the, so the next steps for, for us in general are, first of all, we've been talking about a lot of technical uh, pro uh, proposals. Uh, we'll formalize those, we'll include those into, our next, into the next version of the client, we'll keep working on the clients. We just got a, de got a developer today who's interested in uh, leading the development for the Python client. If any of you guys are Python, are Python or C++ or, or Go developers you know, who, who might be interested in, in helping out with those. Um, then at the same time, the other big thing is this uh, Ether presale that we've uh, been wanting to do for a while now where we get basically the bulk of our funding. That is a matter of, uh, is, that is a uh, matter of, uh, first of all, getting it all sorted out legally, also figuring out what the terms are. So the legal stuff is almost all, do is almost all done. Um, in terms of uh, sorting it out, uh, sor sorting out what what the, what the conditions are, that's still some, something we're thinking of. It'll be similar to the model that we had at the end of, at the end of Miami, but likely but likely more more favorable uh, to uh, people people uh, people who are buying ether. So a similar sort of 2000 ether to a bitcoin, and then dropping to a, slowly dropping uh, to a to a thousand late, later on. Uh, later on dur during the sale, so we will have lots. Of, we'll have uh, updates on that uh, when we're when we're planning to start when we're planning to start selling ether, uh, when that starts, and uh, just o over the course of those uh, either 45 days or two months or whatever we, we decide to end up making it. So, yes. Where does ether get its value? Ether gets its value that it's the. Uh, so it's the privileged current. It's the one somewhat pr a privileged currency of the of the Ethereum network. It's the currency whose contract whose sort of contract has this ind has this index one in the blockchain. So it's the mo it's the most efficient currency to use to uh, to move to move funds around or or to pay or to pay miners. And it'll be it'll be the one that we uh, promote by default. So how will that be different from Bitcoin? Because what you said yeah. is just kind of Bitcoin. Right. So. By, so the dip, so ether is uh, sort of it's it is a right. So the value of ether is not just that you can send it that you can send it around. The value of ether is that it exists. It also exists inside the Ethereum network. And inside the Ethereum network, you can come up with all these different contract types. And uh, the idea is that you'll, you'll be able to create these you'll be able to create 
contracts, which can, which can uh, do all sorts of uh, 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 various advanced transactions with Ether. So you can have some of these financial co financial contracts. You can you can use Ether to do. Uh, yeah. So is Goldman Sachs involved in your legal counsel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Goldman Sachs. They have mentioned on your uh, website, and I'm asking whether they're playing a role in your legal counsel. We have two employees who, at one point, used to work for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> okay, let's get this myth out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Ethereum is 100% new world order free. <laughs> um, well, it's sort of like Coinbase. You know, Fred Arson used to work for Goldman Sachs. Now he's working with Coinbase, and a bunch of people think that Coinbase is the devil now. No. Um, in terms of who our legal counsel actually is, we've got quite a few people who are contacts with open transactions. That's pretty much been the bulk of our help. We've got uh, Anthony Diorio is, uh, has a, quite, a, quite a few uh, uh, contacts that sort of uh, contacts in the space. Uh, is it pro bono? Or um, no, we're, they're paid. Mm, well. I think it's a, it's a combination. Some are paid, some are getting comp some are going to get compensated in, in other ways. So, right. So in terms of right, in terms of what gives Ether its value, like the point of Ethereum and the point of Ether and, and the point of Ether is that you can do all these uh, different advanced advanced transactions. You can do things things like escrows. You can do thi uh, things like wallets, like savings contracts with withdrawal limits. Pretty much all the examples that I gave in the white paper. So, um, uh, de decentralized file storage, uh, <coughs> financial derivatives, bets, um, sort of sa savings wallet contracts that have like mul that have multiple keys with with any with various different access policies. So, like if you so all of the stuff all of the stuff that makes that makes Ethereum useful, it'll be like that. It'll be, it'll all be usable with the with the Ether currency. It's uh, similar to Bitcoin. Right. Similar to Bitcoin. Well, yeah. Potentially. Although as more applications uh, become uh, be, uh, use the Ethereum backend. Well, there's more, there's more contacts right exactly. Right. The the greater the demand will be. <coughs> well, the more it will flow actually, because of course it doesn't get destroyed, but the miners will get more and they'll want to sell. Um, so it will just the, the economy will move faster, and when that happens. The main difference, I suppose, between Ether and Bitcoin is that Ether has this, uh, is that Bitcoin has a finite supply, Ether has a linearly growing supply. So there's going to be a, a certain amount, a fixed quantity of new Ether released to miners every, uh, to miners every block and therefore a fixed quantity every year. So the, the hope is, is that that might make Ether some, somewhat less, somewhat less speculative and more as a method of transaction than just as a method of paying for content method of paying for contract computation rather rather than uh, this, uh, this uh, speculative bubble good. But it's uh, a matter of, yeah. I mean, the, the other, right, so it's... Uh, Talking about derivatives might also, the, the fact that you can do derivatives on exactly. the blockchain might also impact the price. Potentially, yeah. Like if you want to absolutely protect yourself against volatility, then the right way to do that would be to use gold coin or use some, or use some contract. If you want, uh, if you're if you want to hold ether as an, uh, if you want to hold like large quantities of, of ether for the long, for the long term, that basically means that you are betting on the future, uh, future success of, of the system. To some Given that there will be a relatively stable demand because there'll be a relative state, relatively stable application ecosystem, uh, it's reasonable to expect, at least compared to Bitcoin, that it will be uh, less volatile. Are you thinking of uh, so with Bitcoin, there's very little that actually requires Bitcoin as opposed to anything else. Uh, with Ethereum, there will be apps will require Ether in order to continue running. And but so businesses that operate applications within Ethereum will need that Ether in order to pay for their applications to continue. Right. And as such, there will be that. As long as, there is a, as long as that is a relatively stable um, uh, ecosystem, uh, there will be a relatively stable demand for Ethereum. Uh, for
whereas Bitcoin doesn't have that back. Do you think in future Ethereum is going to replace Bitcoin? There are there are certain applications of of Bitcoin that I think Ether is not going to replace. I think the fact that Bitcoin is the first ever cryptocurrency and Bitcoin has this fixed this fixed supply cap. I think those two properties basically mean that it's going to be impossible to dislodge Bitcoin on some level. You know, it's like the it's like the economic argument is that Bitcoin is is the only cryptocurrency that will ever have this unique property of being the first first cryptocurrency ever to exist. So on some on some level, I think it will maintain its value for a very long time for precisely the same reason why gold maintains its value, even though nobody really uses it as a currency anymore. On the other hand, ether might be it might be a better medium for certain kinds of transactions, like some of these savings wallet features for recurring payments and so forth. What about the fact that it's sitting on a weak uh, elliptic curve? No, uh, that's a misconception. So in terms of the elliptic curves, yes, it is true that one that there is there are elliptic curves that are that are affiliated with the NISD and potentially compromised. But Bitcoin that 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 so there's two major curves. There's SCCP 256 R1 and there's SCCP 256 K1. So the R1 curve has this property that it's produced from some seed, from some random from some supposedly random seed, but nobody really knows where the seed came from. There's no justification for it. So theoretically, there's some chance that the NIC specifically chose that seed in order in order to make the in order to make the curve weak uh, weak against some attack that only they know about. With Bitcoin, well, uh, sorry, with K1, the K1 curve is not gener it does not have any magic numbers in it. It's sort of like the magic numbers are, it's basically, x, it's, the formula is uh, y squared equals x, x cubed pl uh, plus, plus 7. No magic, no magic numbers there. Uh, the prime number is 2 to the 256 minus 2 to the 32 minus 977. That's, it's way, that's like way, way too, that's just a, pr a prime number. It's way too small to uh, arrange where you can really do anything nefarious in it. So it's, it's what's called a, 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 a so the K1 curve is what's called a, a nothing up my sleeve curve. Like the, num the numbers that are chosen, the parameters that are chosen for it are pretty much the simplest and most obvious parameters that, that you can choose. Like there's, there, there's no real room for a, for a hostile organization to, to, pick any to pick any kind of specifically hostile parameters for it unless all of, all of the curve cryptography is broken. So the Bitcoin curve is one of the safest ones out there. So what are the curves? Okay, so elliptic curves are basically it's, an, it's a digital signature algorithm, pu standard sort of public key cryptography. So it's Bitcoin uses it, Ethereum uses it. So you're just using it to generate essentially addresses. Yes. Um, all those projects are targeting different niches. So Mastercoin is more trying to be this financial protocol that targets very specific applications that has these like 30 to 50 transaction lists for doing very specific things on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. I would say in terms of Ethereum versus BitShares, I think the analogy that I and Stan Larimer agree on is that Ethereum is more like a CPU in the sense that we can do anything, whereas BitShares is more like an ASIC in that they're, they're, they're trying to create these high, high power blockchains that can handle certain specific applications with very high scalability. Yeah. Uh, so in the beginning there was Dagger, that was uh, largely discredited. Um, we came up with a bunch of potential things, but one of the ones that's the most interesting at the moment is to base the algorithm, so proof of work still, and it's to base the algorithm on, um, on the virtual machine itself. So the issue with the proof of work is that oh we don't really want um, a uh, uh, someone with a, a, a chip manufacturing plant uh, producing an awful lot of million ASICs and taking over the network uh, because uh, the proof of work is ASIC uh, optimal, is, is able to be uh, realised in ASIC. Um, so there are two real easy ways around uh, ASIC uh, uh, making the algorithm um, ASIC friendly. One of the ways around it is to make it memory hard. So you put most of the, uh, uh, the uh, you, make so you make it such that the problem needs an awful lot of memory in order to, uh, uh, to be solved. 
And the other way of doing it is to make it is to make the ASIC that you require effectively be a, a general purpose uh, programming uh, processing unit. Um, so if you make the ASIC uh, the ASIC that would be required a CPU. Suddenly, the whole point of an ASIC is it's doing the same algorithm over and over again very quickly, right? It's customized hardware. If you make the customized hardware not so customized and in fact completely generalized hardware, then hey, you've just got a CPU with nothing for making an ASIC. So, the idea is that you pick a contract or a number of contracts out of the last one or two or 16 blocks of the blockchain. Uh, you alter the contract in such a, a you corrupt it in some uh, cryptographically random way. And then you ask uh, the, uh, the proof of work is to find a contract, uh, well, is to find um, a, a nonce, such that when a particular contract is corrupted in that particular way from the nonce, uh, that it will deliver uh, the hash of the final state that that contract ends up in, um, once executed, um, delivers you know a sufficiently low number. Um, in order for the... Uh, the proof of work to, uh, to do that, it obviously has to have, be able to execute any contract. And because the language the contracts are written, written in is Turing complete, it means that you have to therefore have uh, a general purpose programming unit <coughs> in order to conduct the proof of work. Uh, what this means is that someone could, in theory, <laughs> manufacture uh, an ASIC that is effectively an Ethereum virtual machine in the same way that someone could, in theory, manufacture um, the Java virtual machine on hard in hardware. But there wouldn't be much point. You wouldn't get m a massive speed up over uh, just doing it on a decently high-powered CPU. And it would cost an extreme, extraordinarily large amount of money to realize it. Um, if you add on to that the notion that um, the contract can be modified in such a way uh, that you would need full knowledge of the um, entire Ethereum state. One easy way of doing that is to change the sender to the next sender with a non-zero balance. Um, when I say next, I mean the one with the next highest address, or the next highest hash, when the hash is interpreted say, big Indian number. Um, then you suddenly need the entire state tree, uh, which is something that could be gigabytes or even terabytes large, um, on hand for the ASIC, and of course, <coughs> that's unrealizable in any sensible way. Um, you're going to need a desktop computer with a hard disk. How do we contract? We have a few ideas on that. So one is just to uh, take the nonce, and, uh, which is 32 bytes, and put those 32 bytes in random positions in the beginning of memory. Um, that has a few issues, but uh, it's one way of going. Another way of going is to use the same, uh, the same nonce in order to alter or rotate um, certain instructions around uh, in their instruction set. So for instance, an add could be rotated into a sub or a mall or a div. Um, then you're not changing necessarily the, uh, you're not creating an, a, 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 an obviously invalid contract, uh, but nonetheless you are changing how it's going to execute. What's the point of corrupting? Well, the point is to force the um, to force the processing component that's, that's evaluating um, uh, the the proof of work, that's doing the proof of work, um, in order to 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 be uh, fully uh, true. Right. So it's super important that they can't just take uh, sort of pre-compile the work that we've done, push that to an ASIC, and then allow the ASIC to, to spin through. There is that basically the proof of if we do it this way, the proof of work is, is based on being able to being a, based on emulating random programs and some programming language. So therefore, if you can make an ASIC that can do this a hundred times faster than a CPU, then you can make, then because the programming language is during complete, what you've really created is an ASIC that can do arbitrary computation a hundred times faster than a CPU. So therefore, you've created a, a, a CPU a hundred times better than a CPU. So grab on pushing. Uh, the computing industry ten years forward. Um, the other thing is, of course, that if you do manage, if you do manage that, you suddenly have a super fast Ethereum transaction processor. So thanks for making our network really, really efficient. But, but how would you introduce the game aspect of program modification and basically introduce the non-zero aspect of the computer and make it possible and what's required? In other words, you've created a highly gameable paradigm unless you right. 
so in terms of right. so in terms of gaming, so the, first of all, you have to understand that the transactions that you choose for each nonce are, ra are are basically random. The second thing is that the transactions come from previous blocks; they don't come from your block, so you don't have the opportunity to game it by choosing transactions. So theoretically, the only way to game it is that if you had some kind of crazy heuristic formula that would let you figure, like, shoot, but that would let you figure out ahead of time which contracts are likely to be slightly harder than others, which might give you some moderate benefit, but probably not too much. So is that effectively because people be in contracts and the audience is a contract that the cost of minting ether is variable? The cost of uh, what? The cost of spreading ether is variable because the cost of the contract is changing and not being Well, so the con well, so this, is, this doesn't really have much to do with ether, right? This has to do with the mining function. Sure, I'm mining. Well, not it doesn't really matter because basically the thing is is that miners are going to have to try and like uh, millions and millions of nonces before they get to the re get to a valid one. So because of that, like if, even if there is some distribution by the central limit theorem over millions of tries, it's just going to be pretty much the same one of Some programs are uh, self-complete. I mean, the whole thing problem. Yeah, some programs don't get right. So if some programs don't complete, so miners are going to have to detect. Hey, I'm doing too much work. I'm probably going to have to abort. That'll be just the one of the two basic Ten thousand steps allowed. Or even like, or even twice the normal amount of steps. Yeah. Uh, back in 2011, when I jumped into Bitcoin, I thought that uh, in years to come, network will be used in such a way that you can replace the block driver for the network and tell the network to do stuff for you, say brute force something. Uh, I was wondering if this is something that can be realized in uh, Ethereum. Yeah. Uh, when you replace the block drivers with a uh, rubber that you give away to the whole network, and then the network does stuff for you. Well, the thing is, is that like we were actually talking with David Freeman about that today. Like, what if you change the proof of work in such a way that anyone can submit problems? The problem with that is that we know we know from cryptography that it's very easy to create math problems which are very very hard for normal people but are very, very easy for, for, just for one person who knows some secret piece of data. So for example, that's basically what say, uh, uh, pretty much all of like private key encryption, public key encryption is based on, right? So the trick there is that what if somebody tries to cheat the system by submitting what seems to be an incredibly hard problem, but then they, they you know, every 10 minutes just use their knowledge of the secret key to just generate a proof of work and then they just grab all the rock block awards themselves. Although you could use Ethereum as a platform for making a marketplace and solving hard problems. Say that I have some like NP hard problem that I need to solve. I could create a contract which says, if you provide a solution to this problem, then I'll immediately pay you a bunch of Ethereum and thereby have a marketplace. For a person who is um, not a computer science student, but just a Bitcoin enthusiast, the thing is, uh, if I'm let's say if I buy 1,000 Bitcoin, what I'm betting is that, and I don't know how to write it one time, somebody who's using this uh, Ethereum uh, ecosystem and he's building a contract. So any contract to build or any application that he wants to build, he has to buy some ethers, and that's how the ether values grow? Right, yeah, so ether, <laughs> ether will be the, prefer the preferred currency to you to use for contract execution for doing things like that. So that's how, that's how you are measuring this now, because there are more people building applications in the Ethereum network so there's more demand for it, so yes. hence the more price. Yes. So it seems like a lot of the interesting applications are contracts where the, there's some sort of external oracle to provide some value that right. is needed to validate the output of the contract. How does that work with the mining? Right. So, well, so that's not really something that's connected to the mining aspects. The mining is basically completely separate, right? Well, the way you were describing the mining function is your right, right. Oracle so, is right. Network. So, right, so the Ethereum network itself never actually consults an, or an outside oracle, right? The Ethereum contracts have, have it's, a, it's a full sandbox. They have no way of accessing the internet. They have no way of accessing your hard drive or anything. Okay. So the way oracles work is, so it's basically that the oracle itself maintains a contract, and that contract has, and such that the contract has a back door so that some, uh, and so, such that some specific address has the right to make modifications to it. So it's sort of a proprietary contract owned by some organization, and then other people can just query that contract. Okay, so those would be added into the pool of what contracts we essentially 
Yeah, right, well, so, right, so it's, yeah, it, like the pool that we used to mine, it's all contracts, it doesn't care what those contracts mean from a semantic perspective. Okay. All they talk about it, all they see is just this computation. Because the state of the machine will always be such that you can actually like, run them validly yeah. without being so Yeah, right, yeah. I guess, the, yeah, the, state, the machines are fully internal. If you want to have Oracle, see Oracle, actually have to push stuff in. So in terms of Ether versus Bitcoin, so the difference there is that with Bitcoin, Bitcoin only does only does stuff within the, the Bitcoin network, right? Whereas with Ether, Ether is going is uh, going to going to be is will be usable inside the Ethereum network. You will be able to do some of these complex transaction types with Ether. You'll be able to do things like 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 escrows or like decentralized organizations, use it to automatically use it to automatically pay for certain types of computations, smart contracts all the stuff, decentralized file storage, all the stuff that we talked about. So, right. so it's, a, it's, a mat, it's a matter of the fact that the Ethereum ecosystem has this uh, direct has this direct way of accessing the Ether currency, which makes it more powerful. Hi, yes. quick question. Uh, you were talking earlier, I almost, th there could have been a couple answers to this question about the status of the mining. Mm -hmm. So, there is, uh, you talked about making the mining algorithm, uh, putting a bounty on it, or making it open yeah. contest. Right. I'm, I'm not certain if this, what Gavin was describing, would be one potential mm -hmm. mining algorithm. Yeah, that's, well, it's, or over, well, so in general, in terms of, we, we've been talking a lot about contests. I think at this point, our consensus is that we're going to have Ethereum 1.0 and then Ethereum 2.0, where, and, and it is going to carry over. Like, if you buy Ether 1.0, there's going to be a way to convert it into, the, into Ether 2.0. But the way that it will work, the way that, so Ether 1.0 is, Ethereum 1.0 will have a mining algorithm which is probably good enough. So, or it'll, it'll be some, it'll have, it'll be, it'll have some heuristics, it'll, it'll work. Whereas in, in Ether two, Ethereum 2.0, we'll be taking advantage of all of the research that goes on in the intermediate, in, in the intervening time to come up with something much, much, much better. Okay. Hopefully. So you, so you are specifically talking about something for, if uh, Ethereum 1.0. Yeah, which may well turn into the algorithm for Ethereum 2.0 with modifications. Uh, and what, I, oh, okay. quick follow-up, what, what other things have you talked about putting a contest on or a bounty on besides right. mining? So that's, so that's where we get into this uh, cryptocurrency research group, which is something that we're looking to start up. So, and so, so the idea of the cryptocurrency research group is that we will allocate a large portion of our funds to bounties in order to solve these hard problems in the cryptocurrency space, and that's something that we're going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about in about two weeks. So things like mining centralization, the distribution problem, proof of, proof of stake, uh, optimal monetary policy, all the all these uh, scalability, all these problems that really need to have a lot of work put into them. So we'll allocate bounties to all of those. Uh, all of those, and one of the problems is how can how can we make it more capital and safe and resistant? So you so can forge it, but if you don't No, you, you, you can't forge it. So. Okay. 
Well, or how would you suggest they could forge it? Well, you know, check against these other... No, you do check against it. So the trick here is that first, the, 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 is that the, the, is what you do is, if I have this 100 gigabyte file and I want to store it, or I, I want to get the network to store it, what I do is, I Merkleize it, I take the Merkle root, and I, and I put it into a contract, and I say, this, and I, and I tell the contract, every, ten, every, every hour, randomly choose an index. And by randomly, I mean grab some blockchain data and, like, and choose an index. And then give one, e give one ether to the, first, to the first entity which provides a Merkle proof that it, owns, that, it, that it owns the node at that particular index. So the only way that you would be, a that you would be able to collect the reward is basically by, by storing the file. So it seems like with that mechanism, uh, it's not enough to have storage capacity. You also need to have extremely like low latency connections to your expectation for a blockchain. Right. So that's one of the issues. Um, one way of solve like there are there are there are ways in which the problem can be alleviated. So one way might be is that you would actually limit the ability limit the ability to uh, pay to pay for contracting to collect the rewards to something like a, a, to, to say a hundred specific nodes, or e or even or even like cycle through a hundred nodes, and basically you use the con so you would you would say I want these hundred nodes to store to store my files, and then you would use the contract to basically police the nodes. So you would use the contract just to verify that the nodes have that the nodes have that per that particular part of the file, and then at the end and then at the end only those nodes that actually pass all the checks to get paid. So that's one of the they can eliminate the competition aspect. So uh, this is how uh, decentralized back end for software companies might work. When a company can uh, call the back end by themselves, but distribute it uh, to yeah. the network. And uh, say a uh, country coin right now is running into an issue that their blockchain is self huge after just two months of uh, being live. Um, uh, how would you realize country coin with Ethereum right now? Would it be yeah, you, you would, yeah, you would probably want to end up actually storing most of the coin on this file system. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then maybe instead of, because, and, and maybe instead of paying, instead of, instead of just, instead of paying like some actual currency for the file system, you would just, you would actually make part of the mining algorithm proving that you're storing parts of the file system. So will, will you account it in your mining algorithm so that the special application will be possible for one? Yeah, right, right. so it's mining grid. So the way Ethereum works is that there is actually an opcode which allows you to get the address of the miner. So any contract has the power to reward miners in some fashion. So what does that mean that the miners will not be just some cheat, but it will be hard drive and internet connection, uh, yeah. plus computational power. And yeah. th th this right. So, right, so miners, yeah, miners, so in theory, miners have the ability to do what they want. Miners could potentially just be plain old boring validators, and they could just grab the standard block or the standard ether block, ether rewards. Or, Michael miners could do, miners could also include, also have a huge amount of hard drive space, so miners could simultaneously participate in all these file system projects. So you, yeah. so hard as a miner, you can grab whatever functions you want. Curve break mining. That's yeah. what we're talking about. Exactly. Right, isn't um, caching uh, leaf nodes in the Merkle tree pretty much already? Cache the leaf nodes and throw away the file. Then the file is the leaf nodes. Right, but there's peer-to-peer -peer networks that will just cache the first couple layers of the Merkle tree of the file and sure. just throw away that file. No, but the thing is, is that if you want to actually collect the reward, you would have to prove the, you would have to provide the Merkle branch all the way down to a node. Okay, I was thinking that maybe you could um, uh, provide a, in a contract you could provide the salt money, and that for me to prove that. The problem with that is that that's a good protocol for a two-party scenario, but that's not really a good protocol for a contract scenario because in order to generate the correct answer, the contract itself would need to store the entire file, which the contract doesn't have. Well, couldn't the salt be deterministic based off the time, the gate, the metal? Well, the salt could be deterministic, sure. But the question is, how would the, how would the contract know what the correct answers are? We well, could say uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, oh, yeah, I, I guess you would. Well, so theoretically, what you could do is you 
could potentially store a huge list of hashes of the correct answers, but then that's not really, that's, how is that better than this approach we just grabbed? What about using a, a, a state that's changing, like a, a blockchain hash, for example? So like the hash of each block. No, that, that's, what we're, that's what we're already doing in order to figure out which, in, which index of the poly you have to grab. Right, okay. Because I could, I could ask you, Yeah, you would have to use the hash of, right, you would have to use, well, you would have to use the hash of the previous block to determine the index of the file that you have to grab, and then you would grab that index. So if you want, yes. Uh, I, when you start printing, um, you said that you will give 1,000 entries for every time. Well, start starting 2,000. Okay, but are you going to, uh, is ethereum.org also going to provide the wallet for each wallet, or not? Yeah, Ethereum.org is providing three clients, and we are, yes, we are providing, right, we are going to provide the fundraise, the, so we are, the software that we're going to provide is basically, it's a client, it's this sort of web app that lets you just generate and download a wallet, and then you'll be able to pay money into a, into, into a specially generated Bitcoin address where that would be forwarded along, and you would basically be, and if we, there would be evidence in the block, there would be evidence in the blockchain that you have Ether at some particular address. Okay. Are you going to provide a wallet like Coinbase does that we use the Bitcoin there that we store your Ether with you? Yeah, well, we, right. So we are, we do have three different clients which will, which will contain wallets. So yes, we, we, we are providing that. Uh, so this change with de-emphasizing Ethereum and making it one of many possible currencies to pay miners in, seems like it has a lot of complexity. It adds some new like failure modes and sort of makes Ethereum less of like a sort of compelling, oh, it's a coin, I can own it, kind of a... Well, Ether is still, well, Ether is still, the, it's still the, 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 by far the most efficient coin that you can use in, inside of the system. So my, my question is, what is the upside? Like, what does this system get you that you couldn't get with just By, Ether? by having Ether in, in here, um, in terms of, um... Purity of design as well. Um, it reduces uh, two extra nodes from the tree. So the tree now for any address only stores the state of the transaction. It doesn't need to store the transaction. Uh, actually, it will also need to keep storing the lines. So it's actually a little bit just cheaper to pay in Ether than in anything else. Yes. But so like, like one is almost like pure zero. And like I think that it, it may increase the purity of the design, but it also increases like the complexity of explaining this to someone. It seems to me like there's a certain elegance in having the one currency that bases everything, and because it's fungible, you can still move yeah, well, in and out of the other currencies. Uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's still on the table. But uh, the notion yeah, is that it's, it's a lot easier if you start at Bitcoin and then try to explain uh, what Ethereum is in terms of Bitcoin. But maybe if you start at yeah, something well, generic, right. so the thing is, is that actually two things. Well, the other thing is that does it really matter how, like, what, how it, this is, like whether, whether, whether the Ether balance is stored here or whether it's stored here? And it'll pretty much have the same properties. Yes. Yes. Let's assume that you have uh, applications that carry serious computational loads, but your social decision networks are running in Ethereum or being heavily supported by it. So mm -hmm. the, um, the, the purest perspective is not exactly the same as providing extensions on the store being able to do real world optimized workloads which have extension modules. In other words, Ethereum's growth roadmap may not as much be about purity. I, I understand you talk about uh, the elegance and the critical goal here. But uh, it's long been understood that if you design an optimum set for a CPU, you actually best start leaving some room so that you can do extensions later Sure, sure. And when the first calculators in the 40s were designed, I'm sure they thought the same. But ultimately, what we actually aim to do is to generate a CPU that can do all of the functions of a calculator and more. It might be at the cost of a few, op uh, a few extra instructions now and again, but that's really, that would be pre-optimization, and we don't want to pre-optimize. We want to give uh, a pure general. Yes, it is pre-optimization, but don't you think that some of that might be 
Um, the idea is that the design is, is optimized in order that it can be uh, realized um, uh, down the road in a, uh, a way that is reasonably uh, efficient on modern CPUs. Um, adding a couple of extra opcodes in order to maybe make some contracts that we can envisage at the moment go a little bit faster, um, I think is a bit of a naive uh, direction to make But the thing, um, no, the thing is, we, it's, you can't really say do like a future expansion sort of thing because the problem, the problem with that is that any any transaction that any set of code that is, that uh, that its contract provides, we have to execute. And so, if there is an operation that's like invalid or for future modification, then if somebody puts in that operation now, then that's an invalid op, and so now it would be cause for exiting the contract. Right. Yeah. So and that so would mean so that later on, that would mean that later on, we would have to make a hard forking change, change to the protocol, which we will, which we will rather not do. And your protocol does not have the ability to bootstrap, which is to say you can't proceed to through contractual well, interoperation change the protocol itself. You well, can't do that. No. Yeah. No. So that would be that Ethereum too. Yeah. Maybe Ethereum. Uh, yeah. So that our, our way of thinking about that is in terms of Ethereum. Well, and I'm suggesting if you design the financial structures that your Ethereum 1, Ethereum 2 seamlessly migrates just as a transaction in the network. Mm, that um, would take too long. No, that, no, that's, no, that's uh, a pretty straightforward thing to do, and it's no more no, than turning equivalency. Uh, then you should fork Ethereum 1.0 and do it. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. If it's that straightforward. But we don't think it is. Okay. And we think that the way that we've designed it is, is reasonably a good direction. The problem is, is that you can't simultaneously update all the nodes of the network at the same time. Yeah, pretty much. It would require a suggesting well, so the some kind of application. The blockchain implies that essentially that synchronization has already been achieved. Why can't you, the, the very No, because the, problem, the miners all have to mine the blockchain according to some predetermined rules. So you, the blockchain, the blockchain is the level above what you need to uh, well, generate the consensus. Uh, so what we're talking about is um, changing the uh, low-level rules as to what constitutes a valid state transition. Yeah. So we're, t we're altering the, the specification of the virtual machine. That's right. Which are the, which are the fundamental rules about the state transition. Now, no. there's no way of coming to a consensus on what that alteration should be necessarily um, ahead of you know intrinsically on the blockchain. Why not? Well, it's yeah, well, well, uh, because yeah, so well, basically, what that would require is that would require writing the VM in VM code, essentially, which is like it's an incre that's uh, an incredibly hard uh, it's an incredibly hard thing that we really don't want to do now. I mean, IBM virtualized its machine inside the code And it I'm did. And were they able were they able to do it in a six month time frame? Now it, nowadays, but we're not talking about any old VM. We're talking about a, crypt, a crypto currency 2.0 VM, which is a keep that exists within a consensus framework. So the point is that everybody has to execute. Yeah. Um, which one? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's say right that right that there. was possible. How would we um, choose yeah. what the new VM exactly. specification would be? Yeah, how would right. we do that? Exactly. That how they would have the backdoor key. Right. Yeah. How exactly? How would we, how would we agree on so, changes so to the rules? Consensus network, which, uh, so basically, you're saying have miners code on it. Well, that's true. Right. Is that what, is that actually what you're saying? Because that's got an obvious reputation. Well, I mean, you you are consensus. So there's but miners don't vote on any one blockchain. The blockchain that, that exists, exists purely out of the ether, as it were, well, uh, by necessity. <coughs>
Uh, no, the past blockchain isn't. <coughs> the blockchain, as it stands, is actually just a particular route through the block tree, from the root to the leaf. The blockchain can actually change. Yeah. So if if we get Yeah, well, no, yeah, so the thing is, yes, it, it, so yes, it is possible to say that miners can vote on how to change the state. Yeah. The problem is, is that do we, first of all, do we want to give miners that power? Because right now, there's a, it's a very different, that's a very different trust, that is, it's a somewhat different trust model, too. So, so protocol upgrade is not... So, okay, no, the actual, protocol answer is, the actual answer is, it's built into the protocol. Okay, 100% of the miners decide to go with Ethereum 1.5, where extra uh, virtual machine instructions are added. Great, there you go, sorted. Yeah, they well go with it, and there's no, but it's also, there's but the users also have the to The problem agree. is, what if 40% decide to stay, 40% decide to go in one direction, 20% to go in the other direction? Then what do you do? Well, and there's no way of... No, the problem is that there's only three forks of Ethereum. Three different ways of evaluating this transition. But there is no one, there's not going to be one consensus. Some You're going to have three different consensuses. To the not but there's not, they're not going what to fall to the side. You're going to have three blocks and 50% don't fall to the side. There's no side then, there's no main line. There's yeah. two entirely valid factors. No, even if it's 3070, even still, you're going to have one long block, one blockchain keep on going here, and then one blockchain keep on going here. Huh? So the minority no, no, they're not going to be catching up. They're entirely separate state transitions because they work on different rules. Because you've added an extra VM instruction to one of these. Things. Because the problem is, is that all of the mi all of the A miners think that all these guys are crazy because they're just piling invalid blocks on top of each other, and all the B guys think that all the A guys are quite crazy and they're piling invalid it, blocks on top of each other. If it's okay, we'll let you guys take care of this offline afterwards, yeah. This yeah. and uh, we might have a few more general interest questions around. Yeah. Initially, that those funds will be split off be between our various uh, different, or different, organi different organizations. So, in the short term, they'll be managed by organizations that have boards, sort of similar, similar to like similar to companies and nonprofits, similar to a company and a nonprofit. In the in the long term, we're planning on <coughs> basically convert, converting those into decentral, decentralized autonomous organizations. So, basically, we'll have those funds and those funds man managed by in or an organization with rules that are directly encoded into Ethereum contracts themselves. And later on we are planning to sort of slowly democ democratize the whole thing over time. Okay, let's get two more questions and then we have a we'll uh, have some summary. Well, but in the actually in the long term, the inflation rate of the currency supply is still going to drop to zero, right? So it's it's still in the it's the, the inflation the, the economic properties will be fairly similar similar to Bitcoin in the long run. It'll just uh, it'll just approach the equilibrium yeah, much more slowly. So I think the other point to note is that um, inflation and currency resupply isn't uh, yeah. they're not the same things, right? Yeah. Inflation is to do with uh, the, the you know the value. Um, the intrinsic value of the currency, what it buys. Uh, the currency supply obviously is one of the parameters that will affect that, but it's not the only one. For instance, demand will also affect it. So 
Um, although the resupply, uh, the proportion of resupply will will um, uh, will drop to zero, and the uh, the absolute resupply will stay um, uh, constant. Um, assuming that the demand goes up more than that resupply proportion, then it will still effectively deflate or become more valuable over time. Okay, I'm, I was hoping to have you address a couple things finally. I wanted you to talk about the whole on and how how people and after that how people would participate technically if they wanted to. How would they contact you if somebody is dying to participate as a coder on one of the clients or do okay. something else? So in terms of the whole one, so the idea was, so or the first sort of prototype whole one that we're trying to set up is, uh, is, is in Switzerland. Maybe and we can say what the word, what the word, where the word came from. For right, okay, so it's a, it's a reference to this concept from uh, Daniel Suarez's book, books, uh, Diamond and Freedom, where basically he has, it, it, where, where Daniel basically envisions is this sort of futuristic soci society built that's constructed in this sort of hub and spoke fra framework, where you have all these different different community communities sort of all all packed together and swapped that are most sort of self self sustaining, uh, and pretty much just scattered all scattered all around the world, and uh, and sort of e each community produces produces things for itself and people. If you know, generate generates value and ultimately it's a local and yet at the same time they all work together in a sort of global network. So in you know, Ethereum, what we're trying to do is we're trying is uh, we're tr we're trying we're trying to basically we're taking the idea of of things like like Bitcoin Bitcoin embassies like like hackerspaces all these sort of all these sort of ideas that are at the same that are to try and combine the concept of a, wor of a workspace, of a, of a living space, of, of a culture space, all, all, in, all into one, and, and uh, have, the, have these things that could, could, be, could be houses, uh, could, potent could be parts of buildings where we basically have 10 to, 10 to 20 people uh, li living, to living together, we're working on, on, various, on various different projects, and you could have, you could have potentially have meetups in the space, you could potentially could potentially do, use the space for various kinds of kinds of education uh, to work on, to work on different projects and, and so forth. So the first whole one that we're setting up is in Switzerland, where it's uh, Miha is uh, running his pilot program there. We're hoping to set the second one, the the ones after that up in uh, Bitcoin Decentral in Toronto and here, and uh, have, have plans to set them up in Asia. So. In, so in the long term, we want to have an, a network of, the, of these places all around the world, and uh, like that's it's an idea that's still very much in its early stages. And I would actually really say that Mihai is uh, is, pro is probably a much better person than myself at explaining what the what the long term vision is here. Um, but but it is it is something that will that will really be push, pushing more emphasis on over over time. How are they connected? How are they connected? So, well, they'll be connected in the, in the, in the sense that each of these whole, each, each of these a lot of these whole ends are going to be focused on various various uh, uh, different things. So one of them just might be the development the whole ends focused around developing the Ethereum Go client. Some of them might be fo focused around certain certain cultural aspects. Some might some might be around cer certain kind uh, uh, certain kinds of startups. And so the idea is that these you have these sort of different micro communities that all that all produce uh, d different things, and well, really the connection comes in the fact that they're all part of the same the same economy and the, and the same ecosystem, and they're building things, and each of them are just building things that would benefit everyone else. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure some of the, some of them will make money. If you want to organize a nonprofit one, you could. It's uh, the model is the model is very flexible. Like the, the whole ones that are not making money, we will probably end up end up funding from uh, from uh, from our own uh, nonprofit side. I thought I saw Joel here. So he give us an update on or a comment. But I think he must have left. I thought he might comment on the San Francisco whole one. He would be the contact. Joel.
Yeah, I think it, I think it, it's not to finalize, so I, I don't I don't think that it's a San Francisco or a definite location. Yeah. Um, I know that you're rethinking the early investor model, but can you just give like an explanation on what you're thinking about? In terms of what? What the model, what the model for the like this should be, right? So the inflation, the inflation rate on EFR is going to be lowered quite a bit, uh, pretty substantially from from forty percent. Um, we're deciding on what some of the free mines are. Some might be reduced. Some uh, might might be reduced. Might be reduced. Um, and the general form is pretty similar. I mean, it's buying buy, and buying ether, and then that ether will have the value as the primary currency of the ecosystem. Right. So the original, I mean, the original model, the idea would be is that we would be selling ether at a price of one thousand and two thousand ether per bitcoin. We will sell a certain amount. So let's say, for the sake of example, we sell seven, uh, we sell ten million. Then miners would get e would get four million ether per year, forever. So that's where the forty percent comes in. So uh, if the if this if the rate goes down, this it goes down to say thirty seven percent, then it would be three point seven million. If it goes down to one percent, it would be a hundred thousand. And so forth. So it's the, it's the same sort of linear <coughs> growth. Is that not sort of a negative I think it's a, I think it's an important balance because on the one hand, the benefit for investors is that this this is still a currency where the inflation rate still tends to zero percent over time. So what that means is is that you know after after a hundred years. There might be like a hundred, like a billion ether out there, but then there would still be only ten million produced every year. And then after after a thousand years, there would be ten billion out there, but only ten million produced every year. So the inflation rate would just keep on getting. So the issuance over supply would keep on getting squeezed to zero percent. But the reason why we want to keep on releasing more ether is because one of the problems that we've seen with currencies with communities that are sort of either hundred percent free mined or hundred percent very early distributed is that they're very good at acquiring community at the start, but they're not really good at sustainability because in the long term, what people see is, oh, hey, there's a currency and there's some exi existing elite group of people that had a chance to get in, and we don't really have a chance to get in ourselves. So it's a matter of finding this balance between the short term and the long term that makes everyone happy. Yeah. Growth-oriented uh, economies tend to be exponential, and the middle ground between there is a the middle. The middle ground between zero and exponential is linear in our thinking. No, no, well, it's, it's a power law, and the exponent is to be created. And, and one would hardly say that it should be one, because that's like hard well, to Well, one is, one is the model with the minimal homogram complexity. It's, I can say it's just, yeah. Simple but, in terms, simple but, in terms, but in terms of its nature of matching the growth curve of the net economy that's supporting, the thing yeah, is, maybe that irrelevant. Maybe. Like the thing is, is yeah. The, well, the thing is, is that we have a ch we have a choice of you know, there are so many different models. At some point, we have to basically just say simple is better than complex. We'll pick it. You know, if we say, if we try and make models and we say, oh, the optimal exponent is 1.673, then it's it first. Uh, I don't think it's going to have that much benefit beyond just confusing people. Okay. Yes. I'm sure all the theory will exist. I mean, go ahead. Well, I guess, but, but Ethereum has this nice benefit that your altcoins can be on top of Ethereum as exactly. opposed to being outside of Ethereum. Uh, you guys didn't really address too much the, the, the question about uh, where people would go if they wanted yeah. to participate. Okay, as, uh, you want techni technically. Right, if you want to participate uh, technically, what would you say? Or uh, well, we have plenty of Skype groups set up, so uh, you know it's a very uh, open atmosphere there. We have like the general chat and the developing room and, and whatnot. So um, basically, you just fire a message out um, to us. We've got uh, it's all on GitHub. 
It's entirely open collaboration. There's a great there's a to-do list right there. You can download the code. Yeah, We're yeah. very open to patches. Yeah, well, if you yeah, so if you want to add any of us on Skype, um, yeah, v, v booter and S, and yeah, that would be awesome. yeah, or emails. H-O-L-O-N. Oh, okay. Hold on. Okay. Like a new word. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a new word sort of way. Like. So are these going to be like for just software development that kind of communities or do you think more like physical production maybe features? It's, yeah, it's a very flexible model. We fully expect that some of them will be oriented around startups, some of them will be oriented around like makerspace sort of stuff, some will be oriented around charity. Yep. Yeah. Like if you if you organize it, it's your choice. That's one of the benefits of running running one. Ethereum is the daemon. Yes. Um, well, most people use Skynet, but I guess the daemon is actually more friendly. Uh, yes. System that sort of privilege that sort of privileges us and privileges early adopters forever. We want to have a, a, a system where the effect of things that happen initially goes down over time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so you mentioned about the whole lot of community uh, well, San Francisco, Toronto, and Switzerland. But let's uh, as I said, the startups and such there will be there will be a regulator. There have to be there have to follow the regulations in that country for the United States. Yeah. How would that work? Say, if they would have to be taxed, or they would have to be taxed. How would that work? Is that is it rental? Is it there uh, an award law? Uh, ether, well, not ether, uh, that ether would be taxed as well, or at least being decided on by the U.S. government. Well, so the way that the, the the tax treatment for ETH for the stuff will be is that first of all, we are going to get ether legally recognized in Switzerland as we're hoping. But we're pretty much uh, underway in terms of getting Ether legally recognized in Switzerland as a currency, which basically puts it on the same status as Bitcoin and, uh, and national currencies over there. So they are. So we, what we are hoping is, is that is that Ether gets pretty much the exact same legal treatment that Bitcoin has everywhere else. And what is the effect? Those countries have decided like that. China has it, but others have decided. The United States government still has decided. Well, they no, they so there's a difference between the legal status of Bitcoin and the status of certain kinds of Bitcoin activity. In general, all of the, all of the legal legal noise is, uh, is very heavily focused around Bitcoin exchange. Whereas here, you know, there's no question that just accepting Bitcoin for payments is legal. There's no question that making some just some Bitcoin, Bitcoin startup is, is, is illegal. So it's a matter of, uh, and, I th and I think yes, you know, over the next, over the next couple of years, all the relevant laws will be fleshed out more. And you know, if you are worried about that, then there are also plenty of non-financial uses of the Ethereum protocol. Yes. Uh, in Switzerland, things can be rebuilt. It takes two or three years before it's a free of currency. Mm, where it's, where it's, it's actually going forward very quickly. As well, but it's actually going forward very quickly. We'll have more up. But they didn't go through a referendum, so. No, no, it's not that it's. Uh, it's like a memo. No, it's not. It's not no, it's not. This, it's not a referendum level thing. Like there, there's already a ruling that says Bitcoin is a currency, and so this basically just says, you know, it's, it's not the currency yet. They're actually ruling upon it in Switzerland oh right now. It's not, a, not yet acknowledged as a currency. Right. Well, you know, all those no, you know, we are getting like we are going to have statements from that. Oh, or we are we are we are heavily working with people with our lawyers in Switzerland and and with government officials in Switzerland in order to get in order to get yeah yeah. So we we will have so we will arrive with certainty pretty much we will have up we will have timeline, right? we will have updates on that once that's finalized. Okay guys, I think that the if we we could potentially keep these guys here forever. And I think that the my understanding is you guys will be around for a bit longer. You can keep asking ask questions up personally. Yeah. So let's thank them.